Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The week begins today. The Fed decision just around a corner. Equity futures down four tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Perro. Live from New York, coming up, Fed Chair Jay Powell set to downshift once again. ADP jobs data coming in cold ahead of payrolls and Meta reporting earnings after the close. We begin with the big issue, the Fed's next move. A very important meeting for the Fed. We are expecting a downshift in the pace of hikes to 25 basis points. The rhetoric, I think, stays on the hawkish side. The market's got a little bit ahead of itself. Let's just see how the Fed responds. Chair Powell is going to push back aggressively. Powell is very likely to remind uh, uh, the market that uh, the Fed's plan is to stay hawkish. The Fed is hawkish, but they're sort of reiterating a message that the market's already kind of gotten comfortable with. The market is trying to call the Fed's bluff. The Fed has lost a lot of credibility. Let's face the facts. The statement and the press conference will be very important. The rhetoric, I think, stays on the hawkish side. Those animal spirits are not what the Fed wants to mm. be encouraging. I would expect that he would push back against these financial conditions. Actions are going to have to speak louder than words. Fantastic lineup for you this hour. It starts with JP Morgan's Bob Michael and Kathy Jones at Charles Schwab. And Kathy, first to you, thank you for being with us today. 25 or 50 from this Fed today, and why? Uh, 25. I think the evidence of uh, slowing um, inflation pressures and the slowing in the economy in certain areas, manufacturing in particular, uh, is enough to create the, the reasoning for a downshift to 25 basis points. It also gives them some optionality in terms of the next set of rate hikes. If they go 50 now, um, that might have sealed in more tightening than they're ready to do at this stage of the game. So 25 seems reasonable. Uh, I do agree with a lot of the previous opinions. They probably try and make it a hawkish 25, indicating they're still going further, but no reason to go 50 at this stage. Bob, I'll be very careful about how I frame this question. Is this going to be the penultimate hike of this quarter or of this cycle? Um, it, it's certainly the penultimate hike of this quarter. Uh, we think they'll do 25. They're going to be very frustrated by the way markets have rallied and financial conditions have eased. So they're going to be hawkish. We think they'll come back in March and do another 25. Then they have to pick a spot to pause and wait for the long and variable, the cumulative and lagged impacts of 475 basis points of tightening, what that does to the economy. And if it doesn't do enough, for sure, they're going to have to come back at the end of the year. So when I think of tales of are they doing too much or too little, I think the bigger tale is they might actually be doing too little. So let's discuss that tale. Bob, how high do you think the bar is to return later this year and start hiking again? Well, I wonder what happens if they get into year end and their summary of economic projections are right, that unemployment is up at 4.5%, but you still have inflation uh, at the core rate of 3.5%. They'll have failed on both mandates. And I don't think they can just let you get away with a higher inflation environment, so they will have to come back. And I think there's a lot of arguments to be worried. One. Uh, and we'll know more on Friday. The labor market is very tight. You have very low unemployment and employment is rising at a pretty good clip. Secondly, you've got China reopening. You've got a population the size of the U.S. and Europe put together suddenly getting out and spending. Then there's the whole energy front. We all got away with a warm winter. What happens when we get into the summer? People are driving around. What if it's a hot summer and people are cooling uh, their homes, how much consumption is there, and when do you build the strategic petroleum reserve? But I guess the biggest thing for us that we worry about is the accumulated excess savings. It's sitting on the balance sheet of businesses, households, and state and local governments. And just maybe between March and September, it absorbs the higher price levels in a tight labor market, 
you just start the next leg higher. So those are some of the things that are starting to worry us about year end. This is the ultimate what if question, Kathy. So let's explore it. What if inflation settles down at 4%? I get it. We've peaked. We're coming down. But coming down to what? Yeah, I, I'm not really in the camp that says it's going to prove to be that sticky. Um, we're already seeing a downshift in personal consumption expenditures. You're seeing uh, consumers push back against higher prices. Uh, seeing, we all know the China story, the China reopening story. It's not seemingly getting priced in right now. Energy story, same story. Everybody keeps talking about $100 and $200 uh, a barrel oil, and yet you know the market's forward-looking and not pricing much of that in. So I think a lot of this has already been absorbed by the market. But but then you have to look at that cumulative tightening that's taken place, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And the slowing consumption data that we're already seeing, I think we'll probably see slower employment numbers. So I'm less uh, inclined to say we're going to get stuck at 4 percent. Now, if we do, obviously, then the Fed has to get a lot more uh, aggressive in hiking rates. But that doesn't seem like a high probability to us. There is this hope that we get this soft landing. Apollo's Torsten Slock this morning put this one out, and I'll read the quote for you. It continues to look like a soft landing, he said. ECI wage inflation is coming down. The consensus is expecting non-farm payrolls on Friday to come in at 190,000, and none of the indicators the NBER recession committee normally looks at suggest that we are in recession. That is a judgment about where we are right now, not about where we're going. Bob Michael, you said the equation is really simple. This was your quote. Inflation doesn't come down until wages do. Wages don't come down until unemployment rises. Unemployment doesn't rise unless we are in recession. Bob, how aspirational is that soft landing conversation? I think it's incredibly aspirational. And the, and the debate for us is not whether we're going to have a recession or not. It's whether it happens at 5 percent or they need to go to 6 percent. Torsten's right. But in a bizarre kind of way, all our analysis shows that the time from the last Fed rate hike. So if March proves to be the last Fed rate hike, it takes about a year for the recession to hit. That's when the cumulative and lag impacts happen. So in that year between the last rate hike and when the effect of the recession actually begins, there's going to be this debate. Are we in a soft landing? Will recession ever show up? Did we manage to avoid it? So all the debate that's going on right now doesn't surprise us. We shouldn't be in recession right now. It happens after the Fed has finished tightening and several quarters afterwards. And this is the ultimate debate, I think, around the economy at the moment. Unemployment, yes, at 3.5 percent. Claims near 190,000, Kathy. We all understand that. Should you put more weight on that or more weight on a yield curve that's inverted and PMIs that are sub 50 and have been there now for a series of months? Yeah, I'm putting more more weight on the, the yield curve, uh, the PMIs, which are good, decent leading indicators, and the fact that we are seeing decelerating inflation. And so, yeah, it was very, very high, but there, we're starting to see, like in the ECI, et cetera, the ultimate measure of a tightness in a market between supply and demand is price. And what we're seeing in terms of ECI is the price of labor starting to come down. So whether the unemployment rate's 3.5% or 4.5% or whatever, if the price of labor is coming down, that tells us that supply and demand are coming back into balance. So um, I do think we'll eventually have a recession. Timing is always up in the air. But I'm not putting as much weight as on the unemployment rate as I am on the trend in wages. Equity futures right now down a third of 1%, about 22 minutes away from the up and inbound. Mike McKee down in one. Washington. He'll be in the room with Chairman Powell. Mike joins us now. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Well, the numbers we got this morning sort of lean in the direction of a labor market that is getting looser and is trending in the direction that the Fed would like. ADP payrolls, just 106,000 jobs created, they say, down from 253. However, the odd thing about it is ADP does not put any of the onus on the Fed. They say it's all weather related because of the blizzards in the Midwest and the floods in California. 
It may be a hint about what happens on Friday with the BLS payroll report, but does it tell us anything about what the Fed is going to be thinking today? Because payrolls are a big deal uh, to the Fed. I mean, you go back to Jackson Hole, and you mentioned this the other day, John, when uh, Jay Powell came out with his very tough speech uh, and told the markets that uh, higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, but they'll also bring some pain to households and businesses. And uh, as you were saying, uh, there hasn't been a whole lot of pain yet. We have seen inflation come down, but we're not seeing the unemployment rate rise. And so that either tells you that we're heading for a soft landing or that, as Bob Michael was saying, we're going to have problems ahead. And that's going to be kind of the, the real question out there is what happens ahead. Now, uh, we do get uh, today uh, some new voters on the Fed probably won't make a difference because they're uh Nobody's really thinking they'll do anything but 25. <laughs> but just so you know, uh, some of the hawks have rotated off, Esther George and Loretta Mester and Jim Bullard. Uh, now we have more centrists on there, except for Neil Kashkari, who has really cast himself as a uh, hawk these days. But Lori Logan and uh, Austin Goolsby voting for the first time. So we'll get an idea maybe of uh, what they're thinking. Looking forward to that. I imagine Kashgari will put out the blog as well. It was an interesting blog at the start of the month. Mike, stay close. Bob Michael, you usually have a question for Mike McKee to ask in this press. What is it today? I think he's supposed to go right at their last summary of economic projections and say, what happens if you're right? And you have unemployment ratcheting up to 4.6% and core inflation is running at 3.5%. Can you really sit there and do nothing, as your dots indicate, because you'll have failed on both your mandates. Mike McKee? That's a, that's a good question. I'll put it on my list right after um, Tom Brady retired again. <laughs> Do you think he'll stay retired? Uh, <laughs> and, no, I think you're right, Bob. We're going to get a lot of questions about uh, what the Fed thinks now about what's going to happen, because if they are indeed close to the end of tightening, uh, what is it uh, that would make them... Uh, move away from the idea of keeping rates higher throughout the year. Mike McKee, looking forward to your coverage a little bit later. Mike McKee there down in Washington, D.C. Bob, I want to come back to you. We know in this news conference somebody's going to ask about these easing financial conditions. I guess it's a two-part question. I've explored it all week. One, how do you expect Chairman Powell to address that question? And two, does it make a difference to market pricing? Do his words carry much weight these days? Um, he, he's going to be hawkish, and he should be. I, he can't sit there. And they've raised rates at the fastest pace since 1980. You've got a period ahead where you're going to see what those cumulative and lagged impacts are. You can't have the markets running roughshod ahead of you and rallying like crazy. Will it matter? Absolutely not. I've been out <laughs> the last three months meeting with clients everywhere institutional clients, wealth management clients, retail clients, U.S. clients, foreign clients. Not a single one has said to me, oh, my gosh, I have too many bonds. What should I do? When should I get out? Every single one has said, how do I get into this bond market? What should I buy? When should I buy? Where should I buy? And we tell them, buy an aggregate bond fund now. Get in. Once the Fed has finished, the entire yield curve is going to ratchet lower. Regardless of whether they have to come back at year end or not, our view is to look at where bonds are and predict the bond market. I think this summer, once they pause, there's so much money waiting to come in, the entire Treasury yield curve will be 3% from two years to 30 years. Bob, let's pick up on that. You've got the menu of fixed income. They come to you, they want to put money to work. They haven't earned bonds, owned bonds, not for a couple of years, as you've indicated, maybe for five, perhaps even longer. Sovereigns are at the top of that menu. You've got high yield credit somewhere near the bottom. What do you tell them to buy? Never mind a diverse fixed income fund. I don't want that right now. I want to hear from you where you are on high yield junk credit, which has rallied to start the year and spread to tighter. What are you telling them? So we've done great on investment grade. We've, we've owned tons of municipals. We've owned external emerging market debt. We've owned investment grade corporates. We've owned securitized credit and we lengthened duration. We did great. We've stayed away from high yield because our analysis shows us that 
the peak in high yield credit spreads always comes during a recession. It could be fast, just like the peak in Treasury yields in October happened very quickly, but that's when it happens. So we think high yield is a latter half of 2023 trade. Here's where we've been wrong, where we've looked at how much tightening they've done, how fast they've raised rates. And we thought that period from last rate hike to recession, which is normally about a year, would be compressed to a couple quarters this time. And actually, it looks like it's going the other way, that the accumulated excess savings on all the balance sheets that I talked about is helping to absorb that. Uh, but it's not enough for us to get into the high yield market uh, full fledged. Kathy, what's enough for you? Yeah, I would agree with Bob. We've been cautious on high yield with basically neutral for quite some time. I don't think the spread is wide enough to uh, compensate for uh, the risk and the refinancing risk that we'll start to face in another uh, six months to a year down the road and uh, deterioration as we see in the economy. So, And there's really no reason to really jump at high yield at this stage of the game. There's so many opportunities in the market to earn really good returns. We've been in the same camp of extending duration uh, and adding uh, to high quality bonds, especially investment grade corporates. Why go to high yield if you don't really have to earn to earn good returns. Kathy Jones, Bob Michael, sticking with us, I'm pleased to say. Equities right now down a third of 1% on the S&P. Coming up, layoffs sweeping across corporate America. Margin compression has started. The next phase will be defending those margins from, for corporate America. That most likely means layoffs. That conversation, up next. You're at the place where layoffs are the most likely catalyst to give Fed confidence inflation will get back to 2%. CapEx intentions will continue to get cut. The layoff piece is usually the last thing to go. We're all getting very impatient in this business cycle. Things are seemingly happening very fast, but for economics and regular folks in America, it tends to take a little bit longer. Um, the tech sector is there. Layoffs piling up across tech firms. PayPal becoming the latest to join the cost-cutting push, slashing 2,000 jobs. The CEO telling employees, quote, while we have made substantial progress in right-sizing our cost structure, we have more work to do. Katie lies on a story. Hey, Katie. Hey, John, those 2,000 jobs represent about 7% of PayPal's workforce, and they already had started to lay people off last year. This is part of a broader cost-cutting initiative. They're trying to save $1.3 billion. They're shuttering offices as well to do that. And I know I'm going to sound like a broken record because we've heard different iterations of this story so many times now, but this is an example of a tech company that saw its headcount swell over the course of the pandemic and now has to make really tough decisions to support the bottom line as the top line comes under pressure because of a weaker macroeconomic environment. You can see that evidence by PayPal sales growth, which has started to slow down. And there's other examples of this. Just to this morning, Match Group said it's going to reduce its workforce by 8%. Workday announced a 3% cut yesterday. We've seen Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, Salesforce, a long list of other names in the tech sector as well. And if you listen to Bank of America that published earlier this week, they say that data suggests that some U.S. tech companies are still about 20 percent too big on average, even after the job cuts we've seen when you compare staffing levels to revenue. But of course, this isn't just limited to the tech se sector. C-suites C across the board are thinking about headcount. That's evidenced by the number of times the headcount has been mentioned on earnings calls. It was the highest since the financial crisis last year. And so far this earnings season, we've heard another 570 something mentions, John, and we're only a third of the way through these reports. And unfortunately, more still to come. I imagine, Katie, thank you. We'll catch up with Katie Lines around the open and bow. Kathy Jones, is this a problem for tech or a broader problem for all of us? Well, I think tech is on the leading edge of it, but I think it's a broader problem. You know, it's always a soft landing until it isn't, until it's a hard landing, and that's when the unemployment rate starts to rise. So the tech companies are the first to be laying off because they were the, the, the biggest hirers during uh, the pandemic. But that ripples through the economy. For every tech worker, there's going to be some, some per, somebody in the service sector who loses a job or some percentage of uh, those layoffs will uh, lead to losses in the service sector. And uh, we're seeing, you know, 
manufacturing sector already seeing those wages start to come down, those orders are down. So it isn't just the tech sector. It will ripple through, I think. It's just a matter of time. These big job cuts started with Meta, Facebook a number of months ago. We get Facebook after the close. I'll talk about that name a little bit later with Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Equities right now down about a third of 1%. Bob Michael, I wanted to finish on fixed income with you. The Fed's doing QT. They're going to hike some more through the next 12 months, so I've got no idea how much. The ECB's in the game as well. QT rate hikes maybe as much as 125 basis points plus to come from the ECB. There's an odd one out here, Bob, and I'm wondering whether it's the BOJ who gets set to join the party and what you think that's going to do to global fixed income. Yeah, that, that's a really good question, uh, John, because it is the Bank of Japan. And you talked about the developed market central banks. Also, the emerging market central banks have done a ton of tightening. And yet the Bank of Japan sits out there. Last time I was on, we talked about they may have missed an opportunity to widen uh, the bands on yield curve control. They do have inflation. They do have some growth in the economy. They do have a positive immigration policy. What they have in place to me looks so outdated it could only change. What does that mean for the rest of fixed income? It means that markets outside of Japan are less attractive. Right now, if you buy US uh, government bonds and hedge them back to yen, you're coming out with a negative yield, not like negative relative to where JGBs are, but outright negative. I think if you return to something that looks normal in the Japanese bond market, where the central bank just guides policy around growth and inflation and lets the market price the bond market, that makes that market very attractive. And, and my concern is, if it's done clumsily, it could lead to a generation of repatriation of all those flows we've seen in the last 20 years come out of Japan into the US, European, and emerging markets. So Bob, final question then. Can you tell mm -hmm. me if that's a challenge or not? to your view that the whole of the yield curve in the Treasury market drops down to 3%? Uh, no, <clears throat> right now it, it's not a, a challenge. It, that, that's a longer term concern. Right now I don't want to lose sight of the planet is looking for an opportunity to buy bonds and every backup is going to be bought and will never back up to the level that people actually want to buy. Well, you sounded bullish on core fixed income, that's for sure. Busy man to start the year. Kathy Jones, I imagine you're super busy as well. The year of fixed income, we're told again and again and again. To the two of them, thank you. Equity futures right now down a third of 1%. Coming up the morning calls and later, do not fight the Fed. That's the message from Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson plus Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. He'll be joining us on the other side of the opening bell. Four minutes away from the open, let's get you some morning calls. First up, Goldman downgrading Hasbro to neutral, expecting delays in the company's buyback plans. Credit Suisse upgrading Foot Locker to outperform, saying sentiment remains overly bearish. And finally, UBS downgrading Snap to neutral, expecting competition to weigh on future growth. That stock down about 12%. Coming up, Meta earnings on deck, plus Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson calling last month's rally just another bear market trap. That conversation up next, you're opening bell just around the corner. Twenty-three seconds away from the up and about this morning. Good morning and hello February. January, what a month. The S&P 500 up about 6%. The Nasdaq 100 up more than 10. Right now, futures lower, soft and negative down. A third of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq down about a tenth of 1%. There's the opening bow going into the Fed and the economic data today and Meta after the close. Into the bond market, yields lower by five basis points now. Downside surprise on the ADP report. What ADP report? And then you trade on it. I never understand it. Everyone throws cold water on the ADP report and then 
we get a move and we trade on it in the bond market of all places. 345.88. Going into payrolls, softer ADP report. We're still looking for something in and around 200k on payrolls Friday. That's a couple of days away. In the FX market, euro dollar 10902, positive a third of 1%. What is Eurozone CPI data without German CPI data? We didn't have the German stuff, but apparently the downside surprise on Eurozone CPI is worth something going into an ECB. Still set to hike 50 basis points tomorrow. 109 on that currency pair. On crude, just south of 80, 79 right now. We're positive by about two tenths of 1%. 45 seconds in, we're down a quarter of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a tenth of 1%. One stock to watch at the open, AMD, delivering better than expected results and a robust forecast. The CEO is saying this, as we enter 2023, we expect the overall demand environment to remain mixed, with the second half stronger than the first. Kelly Lyons has this one. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Stronger than feared for sure. You got a small beat in the quarter they just reported, and that first quarter guidance coming in ahead of expectations. $5.6 billion is what the company is forecast. That was just ahead of analyst estimates of around 5.56 billion. The average, or the, one of the low end, was 5 billion. For another chipmaker, though, Western Digital, not so lucky. They actually came up short of expectations, really getting hit by PC demand weakness. The thing is, that's an issue for AMD as well. Their PC chip unit saw sales down 51% in the fourth quarter, but it was able to offset that weakness with gains in the lucrative server market. Its data center business posted a 42% jump in sales from a year ago as AMD has been able to take more market share there from rivals like Intel, which we know, as evidenced by their forecast last week, is really struggling. While you're seeing a stock like Intel, though, struggle broadly, though, semiconductors have been faring very, very well this year, outperforming even the broader rally we have seen in technology. The SOX index is up 15 percent year to date. It just had its best January since 2001. But we have to keep in mind this is following a 36 percent decline last year, which was the worst for the sector since 2008, John. Kelly Lyons, thank you. Kelly, thank you. Thank you very much. Without a doubt, the quote of the morning so far comes from the Peloton CEO, Barry McCarthy, saying this, we run the brink of extinction and that's no longer the case. We've put to bed questions about the viability of the business. Katie Greifeld has more. Hey, Katie. Hey, John. Back from the brink, indeed. We saw revenue come in at about $793 million. That beat both the street and the company's own estimates. And McCarthy also predicted that Peloton will see positive cash flow by the end of June. So investors are certainly cheering that. But that being said, Peloton, of course, is not out of the woods. Sales are still falling. They're expected to decline 27% year over year this quarter alone to somewhere between $690 million to $715 million. But the good news there is that the midpoint of that range is still well above the average analyst estimate. Back to the shares, though, they are absolutely soaring at the moment, up about 10% just a few minutes into trading. And as you can see, this company has a long history of earnings volatility, those post-earnings moves. This one, though, at least, is to the upside. And that's a needed shot in the arm, given that this stock is still down about 50% or so over the past year. Katie, thank you. Another stock with a history, a long history of big earnings day moves, Snap. Snap, right now, getting hammered, down about 10 or 11%. The social media company forecasting its first ever quarterly revenue decline, expecting headwinds to persist. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us now. Mandeep, have we got a single name problem or an industry problem here? I think it's more the latter. And the reason I say that is because when you look at Snap's user data or engagement metrics, they look pretty solid. At least, uh, you know, they're a lot not losing market share. But I think overall ad pricing continues to decline simply because advertisers are pulling back. And that's the easiest thing to pull back when you are in a slow growth environment because it's so discretionary. And that's what we are finding with pretty much every vendor, not as much with Alphabet. So I think Google search still has a higher ROI on ad spend. But when you look at social media ad spend, you are going to see a pullback across the board. Mandeep, thank you. You and I are going to talk more through the week when we get earnings from Alphabet and earnings from Meta as well. That stock is down about 11%. The broader market down a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down two tenths of 1%. Beware of the Fed. That's the message from Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson ahead of today's rate decision. He wrote the following to kick off the week. The recent price action is more a reflection of the seasonal January effect and short covering. Investors seem to have forgotten the cardinal rule. Don't fight the Fed. Perhaps this week will serve as a reminder. Mike, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Mike, you've had a series of great quotes already to start 2023. Here's another one. Bear markets are like a hall of mirrors designed to confuse investors and take their money. So can you tell me what on earth that rally was about in January? 
Well, good morning, John. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, what you know it is. It's, uh, you know, luring people into believing, you know, the world or the reality is different than what it is. And there are a couple things going on. So first of all, the move we had this month is very typical in the month of January, particularly coming off of a difficult year. And we've been very focused in on January of 2001. It's a very similar period. We had a, you know, re-rating of the big tech stocks and, you know, the former leaders and, uh, that was due to kind of the tech bubble itself. And I would argue that COVID was almost like Y2K in many ways. We've talked about that many times. And you had the Fed normalizing rates. So you had this big drawdown in the more speculative parts of the market and, and tech in particular. And then you get into the new year and people think, oh, the worst is over. And then they come back and buy all the stocks that got hammered at the year end on uh, tax loss selling, you know, portfolio markings, et cetera. And you get this big rally in, in the biggest laggards. And that's exactly what happened in 2001. So we had the best month in the NASDAQ in, I think, 20 years, uh, you know, in, in this past month. So, so that's a, it's, it's just that. It's, it's, you know, it's, the, it's a January fix snapback. Um, typically, they end on month end, which is yesterday. Now you get the Fed, which is still an important variable in you know, the analysis we've been doing. I don't expect anything surprising from the Fed today, other than the fact that a reminder that they're not cutting rates anytime soon and they're still doing QT. And sometimes it's just passing of these events where people realize, oh, I guess there really wasn't any new information in there that should change my view on stocks, which should be based on the following, that earnings are disappointing everywhere, okay? This is one of the worst streaks in earnings we've seen in quite a while. And people are now saying, oh, it's better than feared and this, that, and the other. That's like saying a tornado ripped through your house and saying, oh, well, it only knocked out the bedroom. I mean, the earnings are bad. And you need to be honest about that. And you need to say, do I really want to own a company where the margins are degrading like this? And I don't really know where the bottom is yet. I'm just going to trust that it's going to get better. That's, a, that's not a great investment philosophy in our view, particularly given where valuations are now. And Mike, I was always told that you can learn two things about incoming information. You can learn something from the incoming from information. You can also learn something from the way the market responds to that incoming information. Is there nothing about the way this market has responded to those earnings, which, as you say, have been absolutely terrible? Is there nothing about how this market has responded to them that offers you maybe a bit of a challenge to this bearish view? Well, absolutely. I mean, no one respects the, the market price more than I do, John. You know that. If you don't, you're, you're destined to, you know, lose money. But... But I would suggest that, you know, remind listeners uh, that that's what happened the last two quarters, right? We had, you know, stocks sell off into the quarter and then the, the, the numbers were bad and then the stocks rallied on that. So, and then of course we made new lows. So I don't think you can conclude anything if you have, if you don't have evidence that you think this is actually the trough rate of change. And we don't have that evidence. And in fact, we have analysis that would suggest that the trough rate of change is not here yet. We have several more quarters of this, further disappointment, and we think that that disappointment could actually accelerate in the first quarter of this year. Let's pick up on that. We've had earnings from the banks. Tech's still coming in. Can you talk to me about where you think reality might bite on the calendar? You mentioned a period there, Mike. Where do you think reality does bite? Well, look, for us, as you know, John, it all comes down to profitability. We think that the pandemic and the recession and recovery that ensued um, led to this, you know, incredible incremental positive operating leverage environment driven by higher inflation. And now inflation is coming down faster than costs are coming down. And that mismatch is leading to significant negative operating leverage. We think investors, at least investors we talk to, and we talk to just, to, you know, we talk to probably more investors than anybody in the world. Um, we think that that feature is either underappreciated or misunderstood. Um, we also think that that feature is misunderstood by companies. Because not only have investors never seen this kind of an environment, but most CEOs have not seen this environment unless they've been a CEO for 30 or 40 years, which that's not many of them. And so I just think that this is a unique period in history. I think people are going to be surprised on the downside here on the, on the profitability, just like they were surprised on the upside. OK, now, let's go back, you know, two years ago when we were, you know, the raging bulls on earnings saying that operating leverage was going to surprise on the upside. Nobody saw it. I mean, in fact, it exceeded our expectations, too. But we saw this incredible positive revision story because companies kept underestimating that positive uh, operating leverage. And we think it's the exact opposite now. And they're just going to it's just going to be a drip, drip, drip until they finally capitulate and say, you know what? We don't know what's going on. Let's just slash the numbers and make this a, let's make this our final cut. And we're not there yet. Mike, do you think that pain is going to be more acute in tech where some of these massive firms in their current form 
shape and size have never really experienced a cyclical test before because, as we said previously, the pandemic wasn't that for these companies. Well, that's right. I don't think it's just tech, though. I mean, the one thing I would say is different uh, this time versus, say, 2001 is that the over-earning, right, was extraordinarily broad. Uh, back then, it was really a TMT, and now it's, it's in everything. It's in financials. It's in consumer. It's in industrials. It's in you know, uh, consumer goods and services. I mean, it's all over the place, John. And so one statistic we're very focused on is that 80% of all industry groups in the S&P 500 now have cost of goods sold growth higher than revenue growth. That's, I mean, that's an incredible statistic that I think people, like, they don't, this is not a couple of companies, okay? This is basically across the entire uh, S&P 500. So the test is still ahead. The lows you think are in our future. Mike, can I ask you, if there's something you had to buy right now, if you were told you've got to buy something in this equity market, Mike, where would you find it? What would it be? Well, I mean, we've, we've been sticking with our view that you want to own kind of defensively oriented companies, but those have gotten expensive too. And we're starting to see even some of those companies in the staples, for example, that are struggling with this negative operating leverage uh, problem. Um, I think healthcare is still the one that kind of sticks out. I had a good year last year. It, Kind of gave back some of that early this year as we saw a rotation back into the into the laggards. But I like healthcare for the two reasons that they didn't have a big pull forward in demand during the pandemic. They still have organic growth. In fact, you could argue that there's probably pent up demand for some healthcare services. And so that's an area we continue to like a lot. Um, some of the HMOs and areas like that. Mike, this was great. It's always fantastic to catch up with you, buddy. As always, Mike Wilson there of Morgan Stanley, not constructive on what we're seeing come in at all and throwing cold water on a big rally to start the year. Right now, we kick off February a little bit lower. We're down a quarter of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down two-tenths of 1%. Coming up, more economic data to come before Chair Powell takes the podium. The effects of you know, 400 basis points of tightening are going to start filtering through the economy. They're already showing up in manufacturing and housing. Plus, we'll speak with Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo as Meta kicks off earnings for big tech this week. economy is still in pretty good shape uh, you know households are pretty household balance sheets are healthy job growth is still very strong but you know we do think that the effects of you know 400 basis points of tightening are going to start filtering through the economy they're already showing up in manufacturing and housing economic data breaking just moments ago here's Mike McKee with more well John so it passes for good news these days I guess no real change in the S&P PMI for manufacturing in the United States goes up to 46.9 from 46.8 statistically insignificant but does show that maybe a floor is in on the collapse in manufacturing as the economy slows the big numbers will come at the top of the hour with ISM but this has been sort of the theme around the world today as we saw France improve uh, the German economy had uh, more a, a bigger decline uh, but the eurozone as a whole stays in one place unfortunately your united kingdom down uh, a bit uh, as well john but overall the manufacturing numbers are not falling like they were uh, and so maybe uh, this is the kind of worst of it we'll have to see we'll get some more data from the ism too some more detailed data on uh, new orders and employment to give us a better picture of what it looks like thanks mike get that at the top of the air everyone keeps taking a dig about what's happening in the uk I don't take it personally. Okay. About 20 minutes into the session, equities down two tenths of 1%. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley pouring cold water on last month's rally. We caught up with him just moments ago. Sometimes it's just passing of these events where people realize, oh, I guess there really wasn't any new information in there that should change my view on stocks, which should be based on the following, that earnings are disappointing everywhere, okay? This is one of the worst streaks in earnings we've seen in quite a while. And people are now saying, oh, it's better than feared and this, that, and the other. That's like saying a tornado ripped through your house and saying, oh, well, it only knocked out the bedroom. I mean, the earnings are bad, and you need to be honest about that. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo is seeing a little bit of upside into year-end, saying the following, we maintain our 4,200 year-end S&P target, but expect near-term chop and see more upside in smaller mid-caps. Chris, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Chris, let's go through some of the comments from your peers, and thanks for joining us, mate, as always. Mike Wilson thinks this is a bear trap. Marko Kalanovic says fade the year-to-date rally. Do you agree? Um, 
who, what do I agree with? I agree that I'm surprised at the market strength. Uh, is it a bear trap? No, I don't think it's a bear trap, right? If, if there's a lot of talk about the early 2000s and this being very similar, and, and there are similarities, but the one big difference is you don't have the same systemic risk today that you had back then. Back then you had WorldCom, you had Quest, you had uh, a number of utilities where they just over leveraged, they shut down the credit markets, balance sheets were upside down, and, and that just didn't work out. But when you look at the consumer, when you look at corporations, balance sheets are much better, the systemic risk isn't as high. We're not big fans of large cap at this point in time. We think there's a little bit more upside, but really the opportunity similar to the early 2000s is in the mid and small cap space. So things aren't great. Obviously, we're late in the cycle. Numbers are coming down. Margins are getting compressed. You have to be very careful. But this is not the beginning of the end. In a similar way, though, to back in that period, is there a challenge to leadership? Are you expecting leadership yeah. to come from somewhere else? Because I think ultimately that's where Mike is coming from, Chris. Do you come from the same place? Yeah, one area we've been looking at for a change of leadership is energy. Energy might be that. The, the issue with energy, it's just a smaller component of the S&P 500. So can it really drag things along? You know, there, there, we have two thoughts. One, we do think we're going back into a, a more growthy market. But if you're looking for sector leadership, you know, if you look at what's happening in the energy space, some of the policies are going to keep supply constrained. If you look at what the energy companies have done, They've really focused on the balance sheet. They've delevered. They've become much more shareholder friendly um, with buybacks, with, with payouts. And at the end of the day, we think the commodity is going to make higher lows and higher highs because some of the issues. So can you have leadership change? Sure. And, 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 I, and I think you will. But at the end of the day, I, I think there's much more value in mid and small cap, especially mid cap growth. I think as we move up the capitalization, it becomes more idiosyncratic and you have to have to play it that way. It's, it's a bunch of stocks, it's not a stock market. And what we don't think, one of the things that we wanna focus on and one of the things we wanna emphasize about earnings is we think there was a ton of fear mongering coming into this earnings season. So you've got expectations too low. Numbers are going to come down, numbers are coming down. Margins are going to be compressed, they are, but not to the degree that you've seen and, and things are holding up better than feared and one thing that we're really scratching our head about, we're not sure what that signal means, is when companies are missing, they're not getting penalized. And that market reaction is something we're highly focused on. Again, we're not sure what it means, but maybe in some cases with some stocks, there's just too much fear and, and, and there's too much pessimism at this point in time. Well, Chris, it's one of two things, isn't it? It's complacency or exhaustion. Are you leaning towards the latter, not the former? Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. There's what we've seen is obviously the short covering rally has been quite aggressive. We have a, um, a short portfolio that, that we look at that we uh, some of our peers have put together. And at one point, I don't know if it's still up over 20 percent, but it was up over 20 percent during the month. That's telling us that there's a lot of very nervous hands. The other thing is it, it's true that people were more pessimistic coming into this year. Right? So there's a little bit of exhaustion of selling uh, from the end of the year to the beginning of this year. But more importantly, right, there's this phrase, don't fight the Fed. But the question is, is the market leading the Fed or is the Fed leading the market? And we're beginning to get some indication that the market is leading the Fed. We're starting to see some separation between two years and Fed funds. You've obviously seen um, a very different picture than what the Fed has said in the futures markets. But we're beginning to look at the data. We're beginning to look at the market and realizing the market's a better forward discounting mechanism than the Fed. And the data is beginning to really indicate that inflation is coming down, not just on goods, not just at housing at the margin, but also on jobs. And that's incredibly important to the Fed. So that's really something to watch out for. And that's something that's very different. Chris, good to chat with you. As always, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo with a, relatively speaking, more constructive view on this equity market compared to, say, Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, and both with strong arguments backing up their views on this market. Chris mentioned that inversion, the two-year versus where the Fed is at. The Fed's going to be pushing 5% in the next couple of meetings, potentially. The two-year right now, 420. The 10-year at about 348. We had some breaking news in the last couple of minutes. Let's get to that down in Washington. Here's Anne-Marie. Hi, John. Yeah, that's right. What we know now is that the Department of Justice is at the president's beach house in Rehoboth, uh, Delaware. And this is the statement from his personal attorney. Today, with the president's full support and cooperation, 
The DOJ is conducting a planned search of his home in Rehoboth, Delaware. Under DOJ's standard procedures in the interest of operational security integrity, it sought to do this work without advance public notice. But, Jonathan, this just goes into more of the drip, drip, drip of the documents and this uh, potential political headache that's widening for the president. Getting worse, not better. You wonder what it means for his candidacy for the next election, that's for sure. AMH Anne Marie, down in Washington, thank you. On top of that story through the day, down in the nation's capital. Up next, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-six minutes into the session, just like that, just like that, unchanged on the S and P, on the Nasdaq as well, going into the Fed. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary, top of the hour, ISM numbers. Look out for that with Guy Johnson and Alex Steele here in New York. A Fed rate decision at 2 p.m. Eastern, followed by a Chairman Powell news conference. President Biden, Speaker McCarthy, meeting at 3:15. Rate decisions from the ECB, the BOE. Coming up on Thursday, Meta reporting after the bow before results from Apple, Google, Amazon on Thursday. And finally, it's Jobs Day in America to round out the week. Special coverage on the Fed a little bit later. Richard Clarida, Priya Misra, Diane Swank, Greg Davis, fantastic lineup. Do not miss it. I'll see you a little bit later this afternoon.